Hello and welcome to Devil's Advocate. Has Greg Chappell been treated fairly? And are players' individual contracts the besetting problem of the Indian cricket team? Those are two of the issues I shall raise today in an interview with India's former legendary captain, Mansoor Ali Khan Patodi. Tiger Patodi, let's start with the Greg Chappell issue. Has he been treated fairly or has he been treated shabbily? No, I think it's a shame that he had to leave within 22 months because I think what he was trying to bring into Indian cricket was a kind of, you know, a shift of emphasis from individual flair and brilliance to a kind of teamwork which Australia is so good at and which is why he was actually invited to this country. But I think towards the end he started getting involved in a bit of politics also from what I understand in the sense that you know these SMSs to uh, press people and and then um, you know talking anonymously to various people from what I understand and therefore I think having got involved into politics I think he suffered from the politics of Indian cricket also. You're suggesting that India needs Greg Chappell and we lost him when we need him most, but at the same time you're also suggesting that in a sense he could have been his own worst enemy by these secret anonymous SMSs that he was sending out. Exactly. Uh, I think also uh, the fact that it is sometimes difficult for Indians to understand Australians in the way that the, 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 the way they try to express themselves because they're very direct people. And we tend to get a little you know, emotional, we tend to get a little upset when somebody is very direct. So there may have been a slight lack of communication also, which is important as far as the coach is concerned. In other words, an Australian person doesn't understand the ethos of the Indian personality and doesn't know how to relate to it. I think that is the fair, that, that is sort of thing I'm trying to say. But it is something, uh, you know, with what he tried to do um, is something that India needs, Indian cricket needs rather which is again, you know, the play as a team. And it doesn't really matter whether you're Sachin Tendulkar, you want to open the innings, or you want to bat number four. You go where the team or the coach thinks, or the captain thinks, that you should go. So you're saying a bit like bitter medicine, we should have put up with Chappell because we need him. He was good for us. I'm saying that what he tried to do was good for us. I'm saying also that the methods he used may not have been very good because they were not successful. Many people point out that at the heart of the campaign that in a sense ensured the chapel left were a series of unnamed players who criticized him without letting their names be known, even though at that point of time, no one knew what Chapel's report would contain. Do you think those players who refused to give their names perhaps behaved a little irresponsibly? No, I think the players can't give their names because they are a gag order. They can't talk to the press. So it was, it was done surreptitiously and a little unfairly. I thought it was a little unfair of the press also to, to rake up so much dirt. But the press is like that. We have to accept it because the game is so popular. But you're saying both players and press were a bit unfair? I think that, yes, the players are trying to uh, make a point. I think the report that Greg Chappell that you mentioned that has written to the board is extremely important. I think it will bring out several very good points and I think the board should take it seriously. One of the players that many believe in fact dealt the final blow that brought Greg Chappell down is Sachin Tendulkar. Now in Sachin's case he wrote and I quote, if, if the coach has said this then it's true. Which clearly suggests that Sachin didn't know and also that Sachin made no direct attempt to find out from Chappell. So should Sachin have spoken out? I think perhaps it, it, it is better because the relationship wasn't at all bad. They, they had a very good relationship that the, again slight lack of communication little hurt a little emotion a little sentiment i think that uh, they could have got together very much more easily and discussed it on the phone even that why have you said this if you have said it and if you haven't said it please deny it so sachin should have made that effort to ring up chapel and discuss it rather than go public i think chapel could have also made an effort both of them should yes, have made a better effort better effort to, to talk to each other to what extent has chapel become in the eyes of the press and maybe in the eyes of some players both present and past a fall guy because he's a foreigner and therefore an easy target no not because he's necessarily a foreigner although there's a lot of objection to that but because he managed to take the flack away from a very abysmal performance against uh, in the world cup by by resigning and therefore the emphasis of, uh, you know, the criticism of the players was shifted to Mr. Chappell's resignation or his no longer wishing to carry on. He was an easy target. Uh, no, he made himself a target to an extent also. And uh, I think people were, took it up pretty quickly. Let's take up the second point that you made. You said that, in fact, the strategy that Chappell, in a sense, had been identified with was one that was badly needed. Now, that strategy consisted, in a sense, of two important components. The first was retiring 
old stars who he thought had, in a sense, seen their better days. And that takes a lot of courage and strength to do. And the second part was to not play unfit and out of form players, and that takes a lot of honesty. Given that you said we need that strategy, do we have either the strength and courage or the honesty to implement it? No, not yet. Because we make uh, our better players into icons, into demigods, and then we find it very difficult to give them the sack. Who is going to sack Sachin Tendulkar, though I don't think he requires to be sacked. But if you think he does, who will sack him? You have to be strong enough and uh, not care so much about what public thinks or the public feels if you want to get rid of some of the senior players. If taking tough decisions is difficult because of the Indian ethos or because of the way we build our people into larger than life personalities, now when the board is looking for a new coach, would you say that they need a foreigner? Because in a sense, that person is from outside the system and might be both more objective and more able to take the tough decisions. I think that, you see, they, they, they've got foreign coaches in every sport in India, if you notice, not cricket. You've got archery, you've got a foreign chap, wrestling, you've got a foreign chap. Hockey, you, you're getting a foreign chap, if, I think you have one. So people tend to think that, uh, that, that these guys, are, to certainly they're better qualified. When I say people think I'm wrong, I know they're better qualified than Indian coaches. But there will be a lack of communication, which is also very important. Now they selected Ravi Shastri as a coach. He's a tough chap. In India does not need a, a somebody who's soft. India needs somebody who understands, who can be tough, as well as encouraging when it's required. So let me then, in a sense, repeat that. If foreign coaches are better, and you don't deny that. Technically, it, technically. Technically, yes. And if India also needs a tough chap, not a soft chap, and given that Ravi Shastri can't continue beyond Bangladesh, do we need, as a permanent replacement to Greg Chappell, a tough foreigner? No, what makes you think he can't continue after Bangladesh? I think he said so. He may have, uh, may have contracts, yes, perhaps. He's unable to continue. Um, we need somebody tough. Because they're technically better qualified, we perhaps need a foreigner. I'm not, I do not object to foreigners just because they're foreigners. But Chappell tried to change the system, which he can't do. The system has to change itself. So we need a foreigner who's a bit more understanding of the problems he faces and a bit more sensitive about how he handles those problems as well. Certainly. But even a person of the stature of Mr. Chappell cannot change the system in this country, which has been going on for hundreds of years unless the system changes itself, which I think it will do, but it'll take time. You're saying something else as well. You're saying the biggest problem we have is the system. It's almost intractable. We can't change it immediately. And therefore, we're going to have to live with it whilst it changes slowly. That's right, yes. So we're caught in a terrible rut, aren't we? Because that system is the rut. No, what's happened here again uh, is that because he couldn't change the system, he tried to change the players. But the players are a part of the system. so. He, got, he also got a little confused, I think, in, in the sort of the culture of India and the ethos of Indians and so on, and therefore it wasn't as successful as he would like to have been. What, therefore, as a, one of our former legendary captains, as someone who understands the Indian system, what advice do you give the new coach, whoever he may be? How does he handle this duality between the system and the players? I don't have to give any advice to somebody like Ravi Shastri, who knows exactly, he knows the system perhaps better than I do, because I stopped playing 35 years ago. And he's been involved in, as a commentator. I think he knows. And he said something very important because the relationship between a coach and the captain is also very important. And he has said that the captain is the boss. Now, we're not sure who the boss was when Greg was the coach. But that was, was another captain. confusion in the that relationship. That was another confusion in communication. That is also, to some extent, the board. So sport. what's your advice to a foreigner if we do have a foreign coach after Ravi Shastri? What would you say to him? Perhaps an interpreter. An interpreter? <laughs> Perhaps. Because the better, language better, better. miscommunication is yes. a critical factor. Yes, I, I, I think so because you know there are a lot of people in this in this side who don't speak English too well either, and there will be cricketers who come from the, you know areas where English is not the strong point. So how do you communicate with them? And so you're saying get your language right, mm -hmm. be sensitive to the problems the system creates because that's yes. the biggest problem, and then still be tough because you have to be ruthless to succeed. Yes, absolutely, and encouraging when, when it's required. You have to be a psychiatrist, you have to be everything. A coach is everything that a captain used to be in the old days, or a, a captain tried to be. Let's take a break at that point, Aika Patordi, and let's come back and talk about the individual commercial contracts of players. Are they really the besetting problem of the Indian cricket team? That's in a moment's time. See you after the break.
Welcome back to Devil's Advocate and an interview with Masood Ali Khan Patodi. Mr. Patodi, let's turn to the issue of players and their commercial contracts. The board wants to limit the number of endorsements each player can take on, and they also want to vet the contracts to ensure there are no unwarranted terms. Do you think that's a wise cause of action? I think it's uh, uh, unnecessary in the sense that you can't limit somebody to five or three or six. I think you might find that they'll come across some legal problems. But that is not the point. The point is that it, it, if, the, if you feel that the player is, is losing his focus because of endorsements or because of too much uh, you know, advertising and so on, then his performance is falling. The minute his performance falls, you get him out of the team. You don't stop him from advertising. You say, okay, no, thank you. You're no longer required in the team till you start focusing again. So it's a soft option that the board has taken. In fact, you're also suggesting that it's not just a soft option. The board may be operating at the wrong end of the equation. They should be tough about getting rid of players who don't perform rather than lay down limitations which are difficult to legally enforce about the number of endorsements they can take on. It's the wrong end that they're operating on. I think so, but it's the easier end. What about the public perception yes. that commercial contracts have often distracted some players and that easy money has, in a sense, spoilt them? I think that's unfair, but it is a public perception that has to be d uh, disposed of, got rid of somehow, because the amount of time that players spend on actually working on advertising is not very much, maybe a, a week a year, maybe 10 days in the year, but because you see them... It's said to be 70 days a year in some cases. 70 days in the year. That's right, in some cases. I think that you will find, it very, I mean, even if you're doing 10 ads, are you going to spend 70 days doing 10 ads? I've done lots of ads. I take three hours to do an ad. So perhaps 70 days is too much, but let's have a look at the contract. Where I object to any contract is where the sponsor says that the longer you stay at the crease, the more we'll pay you. Because again, there are allegations that there are at least two contracts, although no one knows whose they are, where such clauses do exist. If there are clauses which stipulate that the longer you stay at the crease, the greater the payment you get, you would say those clauses are invidious and detrimental to the interests of the game. Absolutely and completely and no player should sign them. I think the board has said that they're going to study the contracts very carefully. If such a contract does exist, I think it's disturbing. And I'm very surprised that any player has signed it. And if it emerges that a player or two have signed clauses such as this, then you would be very upset as well as disturbed. Absolutely. Very upset. I think I would take some serious action against the player. You would take serious action against that player? Yeah. Even if that's in retrospect? Yes, it, it definitely it doesn't really matter with retrospect or in the future. The fact that he is prepared to you know, not play for the team and play for himself requires tough action. And that is, in a sense, your advice to the board as well? This is my advice to anybody who's listening. Now, the players say that they have only a short shelf life, that they have every right to make as much money as they can, and that if the board spends its efforts maximizing what it earns in revenues, why shouldn't they? How do you respond to them? No, I think that's a fair enough... Uh, there's a fair enough attitude. My objection is not to players making money at all. My objection only is only that uh, players should be able to focus on the game. And I don't think that endorsements necessarily take that focus away because it certainly doesn't take them away from other people. This has therefore become a bit of a controversy, it seems, between players on the one hand and the board on the other. Do you think the board should take a unilateral decision or should they do it only after negotiation and consultation with the players? I think the board will have to negotiate and will have to consult the players. I don't think a unilateral decision is going to help here at all. Are you confident that the board has the sensitivity to handle this tricky matter effectively? Or do you think that right at the top or at the bottom, wherever these decisions are taken, they won't be handled properly? I think the board is headed at the moment by one of the most uh, successful, intelligent politicians that have existed in this country. I suspect that he knows exactly what he's doing and he will consult and he will check with the players. So you have great confidence in Sharad Pawar in particular? I, as long as he doesn't interfere in the actual cricketing part of it, yes, I do. A second issue that has become a controversy is the question of payment. The board, it seems, wants to move away from the graded system of payment towards a flat equal fee for all players with perhaps performance-related top-up bonuses. Do you think that's a good idea? I think performance-related bonuses, performance-related payment makes a lot of sense to me, especially if a contract is anywhere there, which it is. I also feel that it's not necessary to have graded contracts at all. I think it's necessary to have a limited contract, but a larger bonus for doing well, and, and perhaps not a penalty in money, but certainly a, a lot of annoyance and disagreement with selectors and with players, with, with sort of, I'm sorry, the board, 
if the performance is not there. I should point out that some former cricketing captains have publicly written that they are in favor of graded contracts and that in a sense they had strived for them in their own time but failed to succeed. You're therefore taking an opposite and different view. I'm saying that if you have a contract, it doesn't need to be graded. I don't want it graded. I don't have to agree with former captains that they don't have to agree with me. All I'm saying is that the money should be performance related. Let's come to the press. Many people believe that the idolization and the adulation that the Indian press, and perhaps television in particular, shows to Indian cricketers has in a sense been bad for them. Would you accept that? I think you have to grow up. I think if you're playing a grown-up game, uh, you should be grown up enough to accept the, the kind of adulation that you will get in this country and the kind of the way they pull you down also. It is not a children's game, it is a man's game. It is sad that some people can't cope with it, but a lot of other people earlier on in my time when the money wasn't there were unable to cope with it and did not succeed. One way of success in cricket in this country is to be able to cope with the pressure. So you're saying to players, ignore the press particularly when it's idolizing and giving you adulation because it's dangerous to take that seriously. All I'm saying is that both the press and the fans of this country should not get too desperate when India loses and shouldn't get too much of a high when India wins. What about the fact that the press is always going on calling cricketers princes of Calcutta, Nawabs of Najafgarh, sultans of swing, or even simple terms like little master? Would you say to the Indian press, look, these are the wrong ways of describing and characterizing players. Be a bit more sensible and help them keep themselves level-headed. No, I, I'm not going to teach the press anything. I think the press knows what it wants and the press will give what it wants. I'm certainly not going to advise the press. Okay, one other issue that's come up is that the board, it seems, is very keen to send a young team to Bangladesh and there's speculation in the papers that some of the most senior players may not be selected for the Bangladesh tour. Do you think that's wise or does that in a sense smack to you of a certain vindictiveness against the senior players? No, I think what the, what the board wants to do is to limit the number of matches the cricketers play because they, they, they become unfit and, they, and they, they get injured and so on. So it is possible that this is the philosophy behind their thinking. Um, I think in a test series, the best team should go. But the best team for India is not necessarily some of the senior players. So this may be a good opportunity to give an opening to the younger talent to see how it performs in stressful conditions. Well, um, presumably Bangladesh, uh, it, it, it did beat India, but you know, most of us will be a bit little surprised if it beats India again, it's consistently, should I say. So I think it's a good time to blood people also, but the people who are being blooded have to have some talent also. My last question, many people are also concerned about team spirit. It seems from the newspapers yes. that players are divided amongst themselves, they're divided from the coach, they're sometimes divided from the board. In these circumstances, how difficult would it be to rebuild team spirit and camaraderie? I think it's always difficult after you've had an abysmal loss because everybody's very depressed and demoralized and so on. I think the captain is doing a perfectly good job and I think they've got a good coach. And I think that the players themselves have realized that it's not really necessarily an individual game, that for them to perform, 11 have to perform. And for them to make money, 11 have to perform well. So you're an optimist that despite the obstacles, team spirit can be fairly quickly and effectively recreated. I think if you get the right people at the right place, yes. Tiger Patori, a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you.